Um, and um, we are really excited to um, host this discussion um, featuring our latest cohort of the Wingate Arts Residency Program, or otherwise known as Warpwood, uh, which is a riff on um, what we've been calling it before. So um, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. It's good to see Nache and Andy and David and Jean and Dave Leader here. Um, and I'm sure we're gonna be joined later on by, by um, more people who are fond of the Center for Art in Woods long held um, residency program, uh, formerly known as the International Turning Exchange. Uh, before we introduce tonight's um, panelists and host, um, I just want to remind everybody that um, when we talk about place-based residencies um, here in the Philadelphia region, we must also acknowledge the Leni Lenape who lived in harmony with one another for thousands of years. Many were removed to the west and the north, but some also remain along the among the continuing historical tribal communities of this region. We acknowledge them as the original people of this land. Um, and in our acknowledgement, uh, we affirm the aspiration of the great Lenape chief Tamanend that there be harmony between the indigenous people of this land and the descendants of the immigrants to this land, as long as the rivers and creeks flow and the sun, moon and stars shine. Um, and we will put a link in the chat uh, to learn more about the Leninape and how you can support um, their cause for recognition in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Okay, Katie, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to tonight's uh, panel discussion. I'd like to introduce our tonight's moderator, um, who is also the 2019 scholar. Uh, for our residency program, John Dwayne Kingsley. Um, he's a divergent thinker whose professional work and interests straddle the LGBTQIA plus um, identity and representation within museums, historic interiors, contemporary craft and design, and public education. Because these topics aren't uh, contained by any specific institution or discipline, Kingsley created the Dandy Craft website to serve as a publicly accessible repository for his work. And I'll put a link in the chat in just a moment for that. Um, after pursuing an MA in decorative arts and design history from George Washington University, Kingsley moved to Detroit, Michigan to uh, supervise the design of custom uh, reproduction furniture and decorative arts for the restoration of Fairlane, the home of Clara and Henry Ford. His consulting work for Twisted Preservation Cultural Consulting focuses on interpreting LGBTQIA plus narratives and cultural heritage sites. Kingsley is a published author writing on contemporary craft and design and can be found in Mel Smith Magazine, the Journal of Modern Craft and Exhibit Catalog for Alternatives at the Center for Art and Wood. And as a contributor writer for the Decorative Arts Press Bulletin. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to um, John Dwayne Kingsley, who's also lovingly known as JDK. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, join everyone from the Center for Art and Wood and to meet uh, this year's resident fellows. I was a fellow in 2019, so I'm seeing all of you for the first time, and it's exciting. I'm excited to learn about your work and to see what the uh, process was like for you. Um, in advance of tonight's discussion, I sent all of our participating uh, artists a series of questions. So um, that's going to be sort of how we flow with the evening, just kind of asking questions and trying to get a sense of how your work and your process and uh, your uh, evolved over the course of the fellowship period. Uh, so before we really get into the meat of the agenda, I'd like each of the fellows to go uh, just give us your names, your pronouns, and just a little sort of brief elevator pitch about your work and your training and then to so introduce yourselves to the group and then we can get started uh with the questions that i sent you all how does that sound okay awesome uh who would like to go first i'll go first i'm at the top of my little screen there so 
Okay, well, welcome. Uh, well, my name is Chris Storb. Um, he, him. And, uh, well, I've, I've been a furniture conservator working with historic objects since 1980. Uh, although I trained as a first a painter and a sculptor. So I, I always brought with it a, an art background. And I had my own business for, worked with people to begin with, had my own business for a while, and then I went into the institutional world and wound up uh, doing that for the last 17 years. And, and in 2020, just in time, I got out of that <laughs> in <laughs> February 2020. Wow. Wow. Uh, and... Um, uh, been doing private work, consulting, and making things since then. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I look forward to hearing about your experience in conservation. Who would like to go next? I'll go, I'll go next. Um, I'm Janice Smith, uh, she, her. I um, started woodworking in high school when they offered shop for girls <clears throat> for the first time when I was a junior. So I've been doing it like more than 40 years and uh, went to Virginia Commonwealth where they had a woodworking program um, and then worked for about four years and then went to Rhode Island School of Design. Um, I've uh, worked in a design build remodeling um, business. So I've done a lot of renovation and design and um, designing and building furniture. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, who would like to go next? I'll, I'll go next. Hmm. Hi, I'm, I'm James, James Orell. Um, I'm a builder. Um, I started working in wood, making objects uh, October 17, 2013, when I was at the University of Pennsylvania. I have a background in video, film, and design and technology, and I scrapped all that during grad school. Everyone <laughs> freaked out. I wanted to make objects. On my own. <laughs> wood. Wood was the first thing I started touching and manipulating and listening to and understanding. Um, I'm a dad. I'm a husband. Um, I teach. Uh, not this semester. I took some time off, but next, next spring, and um, I'm happy to be here. So, thank you. Well, wonderful. We're happy to have you. <laughs> Who would like to go next? I can go. <laughs> um, <laughs> my name's Kylie Bosch. Uh, she, her. Um, I my background is in wood turning. I started wood turning when I was six or seven in my dad's shop, but um, I kind of have expanded since then into lots of different um, areas of interest and more woodworking specifically. Um, I usually tell people that I make both um, uh, traditional craft, or I use um, both traditional craft practices and digital fabrication techniques to make both functional objects and speculative designs. Um, and I was the student artist. Wonderful, wonderful. And last but not least. <laughs> uh, that would be me. My name is Katie Adnall. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. And I am, uh, I make sort of more sculptural objects usually out of found materials. Um, my background, I went to Virginia Commonwealth University for grad school in woodworking. And I went to undergrad at the Corcoran College of Art and Design in DC for sculpture um, and illustration. Um, so that is my background. And now I run the wood program at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, but I'm actually zooming in from, um, Canberra, Australia, uh, where it is 930 in the morning. It's good to see you all. <laughs> ah, good to see you as well. It brings a, a, a new whole new level of international engagement. So that's exciting. <laughs> Uh, so uh, the first question I wanted to ask, you know, with your diverse backgrounds and sort of um, experiences is what really drew you to apply for the residency and what were the goals for the evolution of your practice uh, during that time? Because uh, it's such a unique environment. So I'm always curious what the impetus was. I think for me, I just wanted to 
to try some things that I'd sort of been putting off since you know, <clears throat> 2016 or something. So I do a lot of work for other people and just felt like I'd been putting my own work and ideas um, on the back burner for too long. So it was, it was really great to have a chance to do that. Awesome. Yeah, like, like Janice, uh, I live in Philadelphia and have, mm -hmm. uh, and I've attended, uh, you know, I've been around the, the center and, uh, and the, the residency for a long time. And I saw you give your talk in 2019 and attended many other open house days at the residencies. But I was in that institutional setting and I had I've never had a chance to apply. You know, they weren't going to give me two months off. Hmm. Uh, and so as soon as that ended, I thought, okay, I want to, I want to try to do this. You know, I want to, everybody was having so much fun. <laughs> I, I wanted to have that too. <laughs> and I wanted that, I wanted that uninterrupted time to really concentrate on the things I was thinking about doing that I didn't have a chance to do uh, prior to that. Uh, on a somewhat similar note, I uh, was interested in applying for the residency. Um, I came out of school uh, work. I was doing pottery and sculpture in school, and I came out of school knowing that I wanted to do more woodworking. Um, and so applying for this residency allowed me the opportunity to potentially like work with these other people that are woodworking is their thing you know like or at least the material of wood um so that was I think one of the the draws to this residency in particular was um having uh the ability to work next to others that um are more established than me and um had uh lots of exciting things to share <laughs> I um yeah I uh, the I I found a postcard in the center it was the it was 2015 it was uh at a pen and the postcard was on a like a little display or table in the center of the wood and I was I was like what so it was like <laughs> two years of my life and I <laughs> and I didn't know anything like that existed and um i've been trying to apply and get in in COVID and things but this year um it's just mostly i wanted to meet people who work with wood and to learn you know which i did from from everyone kaylee you know janice you know chris and, and katie so that was the main reason why just you know conversations even though i was hardly ever around but that's something my, that's my intentions or that's it. Um, and they were really good conversations. Um, I, I applied this year, I had done the residency in 2016 and I applied for all the reasons that people are talking about in 2016. Um, <clears throat> but in 2016, I got, I got to watch Betty Scarpino who's a great wood turner, turn around and become the documentarian um, and she did that through photography and through the blog. And also she made objects um, about each of the artists. And I, mm. I had the chance to sort of think about my own practice um, growing into, um, into a conversation about what it means to document um, people and, and if and how you might do that through objects um, or through facilitating the making of objects. Um, so, and Amy Forsyth had done the same thing a couple of years after. So anyway, um, this was, uh, the, like a wonderful opportunity to be in a shop, to be in a shop space with some people making amazing work, all so different from each other and from me. Um, and then also to sort of think about like, to continue to think about how, um, how you can collect objects and tell a story through them. I think that's really interesting. And I think one of the common themes that I think is sort of a luxury for you folks for the two months, for me, for the two for the week I was there a few years ago is that uninterrupted time to really marinate in what you're doing, which I don't think is a gift, definitely. And um, so I'm, I'm curious about, um, you know, what with that sort of gift of uninterrupted time, how did your practice evolve? 
during that period of just really getting to focus exclusively on sort of playing almost. Um, I'm curious if it evolved at all or what directions it evolved into. Well, I'll, I'll start with that. And um, I had uh, some early conversations with some of the people there, including James, about um, that really uh, tipped me off to uh, some things that I had been thinking about, but not quite deeply enough about how who my audience is for what I'm the kind of thing I'm doing and thinking about and and how I how to understand who that is and I think with the residency it it broadened that enormously for me um, talking to the other people in the fellowship of course everybody is here but also uh talking about the fellowship to other people outside and saying well well you why, why are you doing this and what you should be doing this and maybe I don't understand what you're doing but it really looks cool so um, maybe you should tell us more about what you're doing so I was focusing on a kind of very narrow audience who kind of knew a lot of what I knew about and were interested in very specific things and uh, I soon realized that this could be much broader and that um, people were interested in this uh, some of these aspects that I was working on and that I could also bring aspects of what I knew and had learned over the years and and present that as something that was uh, that people would be interested in and I've been able to uh, that's what I want to follow up on awesome awesome it definitely gives a sort of an <clears throat> elevated and expanded platform Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Anyone else about your how this evolved your practice or your thinking in any way? I, I feel like, like you go for it. no, go for it. I can't see. Okay. Um, I, I was just thinking. I think for me, it it changed the way I work some because I usually. Uh, make a drawing and stick to my plan the whole way through and um, pretty much spend my my like design time prior to launching into the project and a part of it I think was just because I was doing work that I hadn't tried before in part the the time constraints but I really um you know, was able to sort of accelerate some of that stuff, especially the last piece I made, which was the wall hung table. I, I, I actually probably made like 10 or 15 models to get to that point. But, but then from the model, I went right into building it and didn't do a drawing or anything like that. So that was sort of a, a step. And I guess even with some of the other things, I just, um, just started in making pieces and then putting them together or uh, making patterns and then tried painting them. But I was gonna follow up on something that, um, that Chris sort of, I feel like he touched on a little bit. Um, and, and I don't, you know, having done this residency before, I will say that like, I think the effects, the full effects of how it uh, um, changes your practice are, continue to show up for a long time after and, and not necessarily are easy to pinpoint early on, but um, uh, being, being in a space where I'm no longer the teacher, but I'm like constantly teacher and student, um, mm -hmm. And there's no sort of hierarchy in that learning. You know, I learned as much from Kylie as I did from anybody else, even though technically she was the student um, <laughs> uh, artist. I was like, wait, you're doing what now with what? Um, it was amazing. So I think, um, and, and everyone's techniques were so different um, and so effective for what they were doing. So like, I think just remembering that even though I've been teaching for however long that that I'm still and always a student was really wonderful. Yeah, I would like to piggyback off of that. So, <clears throat> like 
mentorship. That was the initial, right? I knew that um, Janice and, and Chris were going to be here, so it was something that I wanted to do. But that, you know, it has, it, it, it's broad. It has no, you know, tamp, like a stamp on it, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, with, with Katie, you know, and Kaylee, like mentoring, you know, to me in ways and seeing how they work is something that was like an extra, you know, like whipped cream and syrup and mm. you know, on the cake already, and then, you know, <laughs> just to learn and to try to try to attempt to see and understand through someone else's, you know, eyes and and spirit and hands and see how they work in relation to you know to how I work and sharing sharing a space, right? And it, it's like a like. I don't know. I, my, my mom, she, she, I went to etiquette school when I was a kid. So <laughs> like ballroom dancing and table cutlery, you know? <laughs> so it was a situation where, um, it was a dance that was happening <laughs> with everyone and sharing the space, which I really, you know, I didn't really say anything to anyone about it, but it was something that was very interesting and it was beautiful. And I wanted to commend everyone. I really, I really enjoyed that. It was, it was trans, transformative. That's wonderful. I love the allusion to etiquette classes. I love, <laughs> I love <laughs> Kaylee, did you have anything you wanted to share on that? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it's hard to follow up on everybody else. Uh, <laughs> Um, also it's hard to think on my feet. I'll apologize for that in advance, even though, uh, we got the questions. I'm still not good at just talking on the spot. <laughs> That's um, okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. It's just like such a great thing to have that time. And I think that that, like just having that time, um, allowed me to do so many things that I wasn't able to do or that would take would have taken me a lot longer to do here in my own space since I'm not like full-time making all the time um, so I don't know <laughs> <laughs> no I think that that's that's true I mean just that uninterrupted span of time really is a, like I said is a gift absolutely um, I think one of the other things that really enriches the program um, and it, because of that span of time is that you really get to um, visit different collections and institutions either with, I don't know if that was part of the program this year or not, I presume it was, um, but either as a group or individually, there's such a wealth of, you know, furniture history in Philadelphia and in the uh, broader sort of mid-Atlantic region, um, depending on where you're from, you may not have been exposed to before. And so I, I'm curious if anything that you saw, you know, either through the networking or sort of object engagement opportunities presented to you really proved to be an inspiration. It's, Anybody um, else? Go ahead, Jen. Um, sorry. Well, I, I really love seeing Mark Sphere's shop. I've, I teach part-time at Bucks County Community College. So, you know, I've heard him talk and, seen his work but but um his method of working is just amazing technically but, but he's also just super organized which is fun to see and and he's just so dedicated to his work and and so um generous about spending time and sharing with people that's wonderful did anyone else have experiences either um, engaging with Mr. Sphere or other experiences uh, as part of the group that you want to comment on? I thought Mark Sphere's shop was wonderful. And I also, um, I loved getting to drive over one day and see Janice's shop because she had a space in town. Um, and, you know, like um, everybody's shop is sort of like, um, their little private brain. And it's so <laughs> cool to see the different ways that people set things up for themselves. Um, it always gives me a ton of inspiration for how to set up my own space, but then also insight into how that person thinks and makes, which is wonderful. Um, 
and I also, we took a trip at some point to see the Wanamaker organ, um, which I had done in 2016, thanks to Amy Forsyth um, and Scott Kipp um, allowed us to go over there. Again, he is one of the people who's restoring that organ. He works for it, um, for the foundation that's restoring it. And um, that was a really wonderful um, thing to just cl climb around inside that building and see that, that pipe system sort of like climbing up seven stories was really beautiful. Um, but yeah, the collections were amazing down in DC, getting to see the Renwick and have conversations with, um, um, oh my gosh, the curator there. What's her name? She's wonderful. Nice, Abigail. Uh, Abigail. Yeah. Abigail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was wonderful. And, um, uh, you know, we also went to Doylestown and saw the Mercer Museum. I mean, it was just, it was, you say uninterrupted time, but I feel like we were constantly being, in, being interrupted by like the most amazing opportunities <laughs> that we could <were> turn down. <laughs> well, I'm lucky uh, and, and different from people who travel to come to this residency is that I've been around here for a long time. So I've taken advantage of all these things almost every day. But um, when I hear that somebody is going to go to the Mercer Museum tomorrow who's never been there, it just you know gives me this thrill because <laughs> I know what's going to happen. I don't care who you are. <clears throat> this is going to happen. And if you're into the woodworking scene, it, it's going to blow your socks off. So it happened to me, you know, maybe about what, 1980, 1981. And I've been going back ever since. And uh, it and they came back you know the next time i saw them after they were back it had happened <laughs> it <laughs> happened <clears throat> yeah i can like kind of echo some of those thoughts too um like with the wanamaker organ and the mercer museum i felt like they were both really sort of like uh uh oh, what's the word uh in the same realm of sort of ideas of the things that I think about and like these ideas of like collection and objects and um, repetition and modular forms and um, all of that. So uh, I specifically the Wanamaker organ and the Mercer Museum had just so many things that felt so relevant to the things I was making. And I'm not totally sure they like came out in the work I was making while I was at the residency, but I know that they'll continue to like come out of my work like or after that um, right. yeah I was thinking about that for you Kylie like some of those pieces that you made that were busier that were you sort of like rounded objects and they're all these lines they reminded me of parts of the Wanamaker organ like oh, just yeah. sort of yeah. lines making through things definitely definitely it's, it was it's such a cool uh form <laughs> like form it's a cool object even though it's like this huge object you know <laughs> I don't know yeah <laughs> Did anyone else have any work directly inspired by a particular piece that they saw? Can you ask us in like a year? Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, but Katie, well, I mean, Katie, some of, I mean, a lot of your work that, a lot of the work that you made was directly influenced by Philadelphia that's, and the streets. That's true. That's definitely oh, that's true. So. The, the, the cabinet form that I made for each of the residents to, to put an object in, that form, the archways and the, um, the little arched doors and the, um, the sort of counterweights that pull the shelves back into place are related not necessarily to the Mercer Museum or to things that we saw that were objects, but to the architecture of Philadelphia. Um, and specifically the kinds of architecture that I'm really interested in. Line work is something that I'm fascinated by. So, so things like the Wanamaker organ, which is essentially like lines and lines of pipe or fire escape, which are such beautiful lines. Um, and they're so plentiful all over Philly. So I took walks every night and documented, I think every fire escape in old city and center city. <laughs> I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure though. Um, and yeah, and that, that came out in the work. I think that's so cool that there is that connection with the architecture. Um, I know there was a young woman uh, who was part of the residency in 2019. I'm blanking on her name, um, but she w worked with found objects that she encountered through her walks because she would walk around all the time. And I was wondering if anyone here who works with found objects 
assembled a similar collection to incorporate into their pieces. Oh, Ellie. Yes, Ellie. Ellie. Thank you, That's Ellie. Great. Yes. Yeah, Ellie Richards. Ellie Richards is great. I um I have a collection of things I call lost and round, which were just sort of like washers and weird things that fell off the backs and undersides of trucks through Philadelphia's terrible streets. Um, <laughs> And I have not, I haven't made, like, I essentially just want to make sort of a natural history museum box for those objects and haven't done it yet. But that, that collection exists and will, and will mm -hmm. become some kind of strange, hopefully very useful um, item in the future. That sounds exciting. I hope that, I can't wait to see what evolves from that. That sounds really <laughs> fun. Um, so one of the things I'm curious about, because uh, we've talked a little bit about your uh, processes and uh, and some of you know what your inspiration was for uh, your works, and I was curious if there was anything that was especially challenging either on the technical side or the more the creative side um, of your work that you encountered during the residency. So like you know, was there some particular challenge you faced in the creation of something that stuck out to you, um, and what would have that? Been? What was that? Well, just getting started, <clears throat> making the, the plane that I wanted to make, the four, bench plane, four plane, you know, the first one you would use in uh, processing lumber. And I had never made one before, and uh, I had not even drawn one out. I'd use them, and, uh, and I certainly didn't have all the tools that someone making planes like this would need and would use and would have in their, uh, in their toolbox. Um, and so the first day that we got the sort of things cleared out and a place to work, I started working on a drawing for it. And um, okay, the drawing wasn't too hard, but <laughs> thinking about, okay, I'm not going to, I have to do this in, in this block of wood and chunk of wood. And at that time only had, only had the one chunk of wood it had to work out uh, and get done with that because I didn't have a backup for it. So it, uh, I had to be really careful in thinking about what I needed to, like how everybody works. You need to, what are you going to be doing? You're doing these things that you've never done before. You've done all kinds of sawing and chopping in this, but never to make this particular object. Um, so what are the things I need to think about beforehand? And, and you know, I've done this all my life. I'm sure everybody else does. You think about it the night before <laughs> you go through <laughs> the processes in your head. What do I have to do? So then the next morning you're ready to you've already sort of experienced part of it. So that it was a challenge the whole way through. And, uh, and I, I had to look for some tools. Um, luckily, there was a, some, a donated cache of tools that for the Center for Artwood had at, at NextFab. And I found a, a little saw that I needed to saw the uh, cheeks of the abutment of this that, that I wouldn't have been able to do it. And where I was going to go and get this in, you know, in a couple of days. Uh, so very luckily, I found that and was able to. That was able to work for me. Um, so a challenge mounted, and thanks to that that uh, strange cache of tools that we found. <laughs> that sounds very lucky. Wonderful. <clears throat> Did anyone well, else? Oh, go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say I think a, a challenge for me, and it probably ties in a little bit with. Uh, visiting places and and being inspired, but but I really felt sort of desperate to to come up with patterns that I wanted to try with the shop bot and color combinations that I wanted to try with milk paint. So, you know, I was I was looking at the the uh, bathroom floor and seeing triangles and you know looking at the columns at next fab and thinking oh orange and green and white look pretty good together and you know just trying to trying to really take in a lot of visual information because I didn't I didn't come with a lot of sketches to get started with so that's wonderful I, um, oh I'm please sorry. go ahead go right. um, I am um, I'm sorry um I, I how would I say? Not not so much um, a challenge. F for me, it was um, more like this needed growth, mm. right? And what I mean by that is, uh, I don't know about any of the other artists, 
but how we work and you know it's, it's this this isolation right and to, and to share creative space and and for let for that to be inviting and 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 palpable for everyone like like i said before to to do this dance and to l like learn from it and that's something that was new for me and um and it was fun it's kind of like you know, the people who you know take their hands off the rail when they ride a roller coaster <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like, kind of like that at first but it, it become it became more um digestible and 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 i became more more learned and in mindful of um, space materials um, my body right and what i leave there when i'm physically not there mm -hmm. and so i was really i was also really um mindful and thinking about that but it just um the the growth or challenge of of accepting and understanding one's uh, shortcomings, but continue to have this um, intent or the sincerity of uh, communal growth. Yeah. That's something mm. I, I found James did something cool. very um, thoughtful for us because as, as he said, he wasn't there all the time, but the objects were there all the time. And I was working particularly in the same space where he was working. And uh, you all know this. He left the apron and the cap <laughs> on the vice. And it was like he was there. Oh. Uh, and the object was there and and a some a symbol of a personage was there. Mm. Uh, and it felt comfortable. It was great. Yeah, he's there. And I was I've often wondered because I've I've works very long time in groups of people doing very intense. Uh, complicated work and you know I'm comfortable with it but I just think the the first I remember the first day I did that and it was kind of scary I had been working for a long time by myself and then I went into a situation where maybe there were three four other people right in the room all doing high quality stuff and and now you got to show your you show your wares you know and what you can do and you get used to it but I'm I always I'm always looking Boy, if I have an opportunity to see somebody that do that on the first day, that's really interesting to me. It was a such a cool group too. I mean, I've talked a lot about, I think I mentioned this sort of every time I talk about the group, that it was a fairly solitary group, that we were fairly introverted as a as a group and small. And so everybody really left each other to work. Um, but the other thing that I don't always mention is how polite this group is and was um, like that introvertedness didn't come from aloofness. It came from this sort of like desire to make space for each other. Um, and and what was interesting was that James wasn't there all the time, but James was the sort of connector. He would often get done with his work and you'd see him sort of like sidle over to Janice and then they would be laughing and having this great conversation. Mm -hmm. Or he would go over to Chris and be asking questions about sharpening techniques or, and it was just really wonderful to sort of see everybody kind of like, like, like wait for like the, the, um, the understanding that they could break that sort of like space for other people. And then once they had that consent to go in and sort of like have a great conversation and then leave it again and like let people be doing what they were doing. But it was a really incredible group in terms of just this very polite, like, may I enter your space? May I have a conversation with you? No, okay, you're busy, fine. You know, no one's offended. <laughs> I, yes, okay, let's have a great conversation and then go back to what we're doing. It was wonderful. I think that's really a good point about James being a connector because we've we've sort of I know one of the questions is going to be about working in that space and we've talked about how uh, like Katie was sometimes in the front with Kylie Kylie was often back with the lathe all by herself uh, James and I tended to work in the in the bench area and sometimes Katie came back there and Chris usually stayed in the in the front area, but but I I think just James being willing to ask, you know, questions that went below the surface and and um, bring up ideas was great because it it just gave you something to think about during the day and talk to each other about and it was really fantastic. 
That's really cool that that sort of happened spontaneously, for sure. Did you, um, I'm curious, sort of unrelated to this, um, one of the things that I noticed coming in in 2019 was, um, you know, as, a, as the scholar, I could sort of do a similar thing, like connect people, connect ideas, and start mm. to set aside structured time to discuss the evolution of process, the evolution of ideas and everything. And I think it got people to think in a slightly different way at the, at the halfway point, you know, um, and just to kind of sum up, because I only had a week and I wasn't sure what was going to come after that. So it's, it was sort of an interesting juncture to summarize, um, you know, what the process had been so far at the, at the median. And so I'm wondering if, um, as feedback for the center, do you think more structured time built in for that kind of thing along the way would be helpful? Like either, you know, weekly meetings or something like that as the fellowship evolves, would that be something that would be useful? Or is it just more happy when it's organic? I liked the organic nature of it. I think, um, you know, they, it, again, I feel like there was sort of this politeness in terms of, um, and politeness is maybe not the right word, but just this sort of like, um, since that everyone was very much aware of, of, of what time means, you know, and, and knowing that this is a finite amount of time that everybody had sort of like taken for themselves to make this work. And they had probably stolen that time from other important tasks um, and parts of their lives. And so I think sort of like, rather than having sort of a structured time where you're, you sort of feel like maybe even potentially resentful that you have to go and do this other thing, to have somebody just wander up to you and say like, you know, like Chris would come up and ask just this incredible question, like, you know, like I, about whatever I was doing or, or James or Ky, like anybody would just like come over and be like, so, so why are you doing it that way? And it's great. This is wonderful. But it, um, that felt less like an interruption and more like a part of the flow of the day, That's you know, cool. and I loved that. It uh, is of interest to me. I probably have been to every residency, and I'm sure the only other one on the screen that would be that would be Albert. Um, and each time there is a personality to the group as a whole. Um, and they're very different from each other. Um, so that there's there's no like set pattern. Um, the only thing that's ordinarily been like set is the space that you work in. And this year it was different than it well, it was once or twice before in, in that space, but it had been at um, the University of the Arts for a number of years. And before that, it had been at the George School for a number of years. And that helped determine in some ways what kind of interactions took place because the spaces were kind of on the small side. And um, the thing that struck me most to, uh, this year was how big a space you were working in and how easily you could move away from each other if you chose to. Um, and it sounds like even though people were working in rather different spaces, there also was interaction, um, fairly intense interaction at times. Um, in response to the question about, does it make sense for the center to try to structure time in? I, I would be reluctant to to do much other than than what's done now, which is to um, to make sure that there is this person that's a scholar and and there is a person that that's doing some other stuff and and that there are some fairly interesting people that get invited to um, to to do the thing. Um, I also like the fact that there's at least a little bit of repetition that there are people that come back a second time. I think that. That's a really nice feature. Um, and I see Albert has come on the screen, so I'll let, uh, I'll let him talk if he wants, so. Well, I experienced many of the residency programs and they're each unique. And I used to have weekly meetings, um, but I like it when um, we meet over a meal. Mm. Mm. Um, that was one of the nice things 
at the George School. Uh, they all lived in a house and uh, they shared a kitchen. And the same thing happened at UArts uh, when they shared a kitchen and getting together over a meal, whether it's somebody who's cooking it or they go out to a restaurant, it's a good time to have a chat. Uh, but it really depends on the grouping, whether a weekly meeting or periodic meeting is of value. And I always played that by ear. Um, talking about cooking, um, I'll never forget the French uh, when they came. They were such great cooks that we we're going to put a criterion in that there had to be at least one French person in the residency <laughs> program so they could cook for everybody. Uh, but I, I personally loved uh, talking to each of the residents uh, at the beginning, uh, during the orientation, and then um, once at least during the program. And of course, at the end. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I'd imagine it gives you a good sense of the evolution. Um, so I'm, we've talked a lot about, you know, the space, the configuration, and sort of the spontaneous interactions that occurred. And I'm curious, you know, what were some of your big takeaways from these interactions in terms of the change of your process, the change, uh, you know, of critical feedback or engagement? I'm curious how that sort of moved the barometer of what you were doing, if it did at all. Well, I've already mentioned the idea that uh, there's a different audience for the things I'm doing and that if I, um, instead of talking to some people who I think sort of follow what I'm doing and sort of have a big, have a great background in, in the, what I'm talking about, if I open it up and say, well, you know, here, here's what I've been doing. Um, this is how I got to be and know what I know and how it happened. And it is, it's not, everybody has their own story and it's different. And my story has, you know, there's a way to tell it that, um, that I've not done. And so that is something I'm taking away from this, that, uh, that there, everybody, I'm interested in everything everybody's doing and people were interested in what I was doing and what, why am I doing that? And that they would have no idea unless I tell them. So my my job is to start telling them. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think Chris, you're you're sort of a really good ambassador, like even doing demonstrations out in Efforts Alley and that kind of thing, just talking to everybody who walks by who's interested. It's it's um it's great, you know, not not just tying into one group or something. And you sort of did that at, at NextFab with, um, with Gwen, who was talking to you about, about hand planing. And I think all of us were just like, oh, hand plane. You know? <laughs> and she tried it out. But it was, it, you know, it was just really fun to see how, how that um, classic woodworking is, is sort of a foundation for everybody. Yeah, well, I forget. Sometimes I think, well, everybody knows about this. They don't need me to tell them about it. And then, <laughs> then I find out, well, nobody knows anything about this. <laughs> Maybe they need me to tell them. About it. <laughs> Kaylee, I'm curious as a student who is kind of coming up into this world, you know, what was the uh, what was your takeaway from this sort of engagement in this unique environment with the cross pollination of ideas? I mean, I I presume you work out of a wood shop in a school. Was it kind of similar to that or did you have a different experience? Um, so I work out of a wood shop in my dad's studio. He's also a woodworker. So I feel pretty lucky to have that. <laughs> like that's a, but it was nice to work in, in this other space with other people that um, are also woodworkers because they had such different perspectives. Um, and I don't know. I, I remember coming in kind of intimidated by like the other residents. I'm like, oh man, these people are like all teachers or they're all like doing their own thing and uh, pretty uh, well known in certain in woodworking. I mean, as big or as small as you want that field to be. Um, 
so I remember being a little bit intimidated by that but once I was there I realized that uh it's it's just a really like open space and like uh everybody's there for the same reason um yeah I don't know that probably didn't even really answer the question but no I, I can echo that to a certain extent because I came in as a scholar and for some of the other panels we've done I've been the sort of the moderator but I'm, I'm not a practicing woodworker I mm -hmm. have a background in sort of the academic and history side of things and I'm always I took one class in grad school on the techniques of furniture making it was 18th century furniture making it was taught by Oscar Fitzgerald who I'm sure some of you have heard of um, and it was really and how miserably I failed <laughs> some of the things that I tried <laughs> And it's so humbling to be with people who have such a very different level of engagement. It's really just, I learn so much every time we have these conversations. So I definitely can appreciate that perspective. This group was so different in terms of their, the ways that they all came to woodworking too. Um, and, and the kinds of sort of resources that they pulled from, from Chris's background as a conservator to to James's background as a sculptor um, using a ton of found materials um, you know to, to Kylie sort of like bridging the gap between this kind of old tech uh, wood turning and like like 3d printing parts over you know like with her robots in the in the and and Janice was doing the same thing go, jumping from like using hide glue to using the CNC um, I think that uh, for me just sort of like this reminder that they're like that that the only right way to do something is the way that it works you know like that there isn't just one one path but but there are all these different ways to sort of think about how you are going to put something together and like all of the things that i teach now as assumptions need to be looked at again and questioned mm. um like that was a really like why does a thing need to be finished you know like there's so many like why why does a joint need to last for 200 years like there's like really good questions to be asked and the answers can be different depending on what you're trying to do um so that was really wonderful that's really cool that's a, i think that's a really powerful takeaway absolutely yeah absolutely And um, I'm mindful that we have a few minutes left. I think we are about to end at about 7.30. So I'm curious uh, as sort of a capstone for our conversation, um, you know, what's coming next for everybody? You know, uh, the exhibit closes shortly, <laughs> I think from what we were discussing. Nope, not it's a little bit uh, time. Okay, um, and now we'll give you the details. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the... Um, <clears throat> Now that the the period the the fellowship period has kind of come to a close and you've had some time to marinate, uh, what's coming next for folks? Do you have any goals or ambitions for the coming year or uh, things we should keep an eye out for uh, for folks who are in being introduced to you for the first time and want to follow what you're doing? Hmm. Well, I'm still I'm making the things. One, I'm. <laughs> I'm happy to get some of the, my things back <laughs> that, <laughs> that are that are not staying there. Uh, I have I put one piece in the in the show that I made a long time ago, um, that it, it like stores all my special stuff, all that box with all the drawers in it, you know, the spice box, and I I was kind of reluctant to put it in the show, but then I realized, well, I really have to. That I got to I have to put this in. So I had to empty them. What are there? One, two, three, four, uh, 10, 12 drawers, little drawers. And each one of them has a special little collection of something in it. And I had to empty every one of those out. Yeah. <laughs> I have them in a box or in two boxes here. And uh, I needed to look for something in one of those drawers the other day. And I realized I I'm never going to be able to find it because it's in this big box. But I would have known just where it was if it was still in the drawer. <laughs> so I'm going to be happy to have that back. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, um, I was able to jump into this um, tool making phase that that the fellowship gave me a time to do and a chance to do. And I, I've wanted to do it for a while and never was able to do it. And now I'm continuing doing that. I'm still investigating, experimenting and sharing and sharing that. And one of the things I thought about 
between the end of the residency as I started doing more of that. Now, is that I've been studying and working with historic furniture for a long, long time. And it's, uh, you know, I've seen thousands of pieces and worked on hundreds and hundreds of pieces. And they, we, there are still discoveries and new things to see all the time. But I have a, you know, I have a good handle on it. And I've seen so much of it. And it, what anybody who looks at um, the history of tools that survive is that nothing, practically nothing survives from before 1750 uh, in, in English British American woodworking traditions. There, there may be a couple hundred things that, that we can't own, we can't hide, I can't go see them. Um, mm -hmm. And yet they were so, had so much to do with the making of the stuff that I dealt with all this time. And that's the mystery that I haven't explored yet. And I'm looking forward to doing that. I think that's wonderful. There, yeah, there is sort of a lost narrative there, certainly, absolutely. James, I'm curious, what's next coming up for you? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm interested too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm at a, I'm at a pivot, uh, spending time with my family. Um, I wanted to like throw, um, not throw, but acknowledge uh, the, the committee of selections. Mm. And because this, I, I, I can't, I can't help but to say that how hard I'm, I'm, I'm starting to more and more with residencies, but because of this one and, and, and the numbers and how much time you spend in the compactness and what has to happen, it's, it's like this matchmaking, mm -hmm. right? But you're dealing with family and so, so much like thought has to like was there the possibilities of these people gelling and coming together and it, it, it's extremely beautiful and, and, and mindful and, and coming back full circle to like family and, and the things that um kept me thinking about the residency and everyone in the residency but also my own family at at the time and as i move forward to continue to um make work and create and to, to find a studio so I won't have to always complain and whine about that is something that um just the the opportunity to to be around amazing people and and knowing that the relationships and the in the in the conversations that you share but you're also I'm not just responsible for myself but I'm also responsible for the conversations that I had with everyone and to hold those close to my heart and be responsible and claim that as I continue to go forward and create and to grow as a, as a human being, which I want to thank everyone for that. Um, allowing that for me to enter those spaces in your, in your lives creatively, um, spiritually, but also as people. And, um, that's my takeaway. And that's what I'm going to be doing hopefully in the future, as long as I, continue to breathe and stay on this earth <laughs> <laughs> that's really beautifully said absolutely yeah yeah Haley, what's next coming up for you uh well i was doing so this was the second residency that i did this year so um i was in like a pretty heavy workflow um for that um and it's kind of nice now to like be back in like my normal workflow of like i have studio time and I have this space and honestly right now what I'm doing is like solving some like technical problems that I didn't ha I haven't had time to solve that just like take longer um than uh or, or things that I didn't want to do during the residency because it wasn't uh, that wasn't what that time and that space was for but now that I have that time and space there's like some um just like technical problems as far as like um my skill set or technical problems as far as like the things that I want to do and aren't sure how to do them and I knew that it was going to take a long time to figure that out so um, I'm just working. I'm, I'm uh, applying for things and uh, doing <laughs> lots and lots and lots of stuff. I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of a little crazy, but uh, yeah, I just uh, kind of try and try my best to uh, move forward. I don't know. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Katie, I'm curious, is there any opportunities coming up for you in Australia? Um, well, I'm actually uh, in the middle of, or at the very beginning of a residency here. So I am at a place called Strathnarn Arts Center, um, which is on the edge of Canberra, um, sort of looking out over a really beautiful wilderness. Um, and I am in a, a small apartment that's attached to one of their studio spaces. They offer studio spaces to, um, as sort of like, um, um, incubators for artists starting out. So there's 22 little buildings around this uh, piece of property and a small cafe and a gallery. Um, and then one of those um, 22 studios has a little apartment attached for visiting artists for residents. So that's where I am. And I'll be here for this month with um, Ashley Erickson, who is a fellow from 2016. She and I did the residency together at the Center for Wood in 2016. Um, so, you know, like the longevity of the effects of these residencies um, is real because I'm sort of reeling from what I did this summer with this wonderful cohort while I'm also um, like just now starting to sort of like take up some of the uh, really wonderful benefits of, of broadening my network of friends and makers from 2016. Um, so yeah, so Ashley and I will be making a piece together over the next month that talks about the common interests we have as artists and about the ways that we just experienced a three week trip through Japan. So we, we got off the plane from Japan five days ago and are here in Canberra where she teaches at Australia National University, but it's off for the semester and I'm off for the semester too. Um, and we'll be will be making work. So I'll be posting about that on Instagram if anyone's interested. Um, but I suspect that, again, the effects of this residency will continue to um, show in my work for years to come, so. That's really wonderful. Janice, how about for you? I don't remember if you've spoken already or not for this. Um, well, I, I actually have to move out of my shop. So um, th that's sort of, causing me to think about what kind of changes I want to make. But but um, I think I'll probably move in with somebody who has a shop bot so I can keep doing some <laughs> of the, the patterns I was working with. So that would be great. Um, and mostly I just hope to put a, put a bigger focus on doing my own work instead of working for other people. So. That's really wonderful. Uh, well, uh, before we close, I'm curious if the, anyone from the audience has any questions for our uh, visiting artists. I have a question for all of the uh, residents. If you were telling someone about um, the Center for Art and Wood and the Wingate Residency, and you were in, and they asked you for one piece of advice um, about encouraging them to apply what would you say you should apply you should do it <laughs> just do it <laughs> jump in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i always if i can venture a couple of words on this topic um i i always say whether it's an open call for an exhibition or um, or a residency call. Um, I, I always, if the people are wavering on the decision whether to apply or not, I say go for it because um, whether or not you, you actually end up being accepted into the exhibition or the residency or the award or whatever it is, um, is, is sort of end line consequential, but on the way, don't forget that you have many professional people who are looking at your work and getting familiar with it and thinking about it and sometimes even writing about it. And um, so that's one benefit. The next benefit is many times in my own career, I have maybe not juried someone into something, but I've called them up later and said, I need to work with you on this exhibition or, or you know, this commission. Um, it's happened many times. So just being a part of a curator or a historian or a teacher or an educator or another artist's um, 
sort of mental Rolodex is um, huge value, enormous value, not only to them and their sort of catalog of um, expanding catalog of artwork and their and artists, but also to you um, because it might result in opportunity. And I Thanks, said this. Sal, the other day. I needed to hear that, especially from you. I've been having a crisis of confidence crisis of confidence about what I'm making lately so yeah just go for it but but uh yeah it's about what I've been working on all along for the center and how that's not done because my skills are not up to where I thought they'd be and I'm still learning but it's it's like I'm just I'm just having a a a general crisis of confidence lately about even about painting you know I've been doing it for ages so um yeah we'll work I, I don't want to I don't want to divert from the topic at hand but yeah I just wanted to say that because we'll on that Nishay. okay yeah. well um <laughs> One of the things I think is that I, you know, I think as people in the arts, we all definitely have, you know, kind of crisis moments of confidence or imposter syndrome or something, especially when you're working in such a really rich and diverse field. And I have to say that, you know, um, one of the things that I'm incredibly grateful for uh, with the center is that it really does curate a very intentional groups of people that all it always turns out to be fabulous like every time <laughs> like it's just a really interesting mix of ideas and people and um you know coming I kind of came into this a little bit blind because I hadn't been in the uh shop with you all for the uh as the scholar it, it is the embedded scholar this time but I feel like I've gotten to know each of you a little bit and learned so much from uh having learned about your process vicariously and even when I was there at the time in 2019, it was just a wealth of material that I could draw from, from the people I was surrounded by. And I think that's something the center really excels in is the, the kind of the intentional space for people to gather, to learn and to share. And that's something I've really been grateful for. And I think, um, you know, I'd like to echo that this evening because it's been a really wonderful group of people and I'm privileged to have met all of you. So thank you for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Nava and Katie, do we have anything, uh, do you have anything before we sign off? Um, just that the exhibition, which is titled Overlap, is um, continuing through to the end of this month. October 24th, this is Sunday, that's the last day. Um, the work on view is um, mostly for sale. So if you fall in love with something and you can't live without it, you're in very, very good luck because you can actually take it home. Um, this is the only selling show that we do annually. So it's a really um, amazing opportunity. So come on by. Um, also, Katie and Albert reminds, uh, remind us that um, there will be a Matterport um, tour of the exhibition hosted on the website so um, and that'll be hosted in perpetuity so even after the exhibition closes you can still sort of have a virtual window into the show and its installation thanks albert <laughs> um, i'm just really thrilled that everyone could make all of the artist fellows could make it tonight this is such a treat and um I can't wait for the Where Are They Now installment of the story. <laughs> um, we'll have to start planning now to make sure we get a date, but uh, it's really it's really very, very generous. Um, first of all, you take two months out of your busy lives to spend um, on this residency, which does so much for the future of art in wood and brings so much learning um, to the public um, through your transparency and your willingness to share and also spend time crunched together in some very interesting um, configurations of woodworking. Um, and that's an, that's an amazing thing. And, and Albert saw, I think, the vision and the promise of that and the fact that we've been able to continue doing it for 25 years is, um, is really incredible. And 
um, we just continue to learn and learn and learn every year from this. Um, and this year's cohort was no less um, valued and surprising and innovative and incredible. Um, so thank you so much to all of you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>